uh, the persuasion, this persuasion coming out of him that calleth you. This is going to be part two, this persuasion coming out of him that calleth you. Uh, you know, there's a lot of persuasion in the world, in the religious world, and also amongst our families, our friends. Uh, in Galatians 5, 4 through 10, as we read this past Wednesday, was part one. Uh, a lot of Jews were persuading the Galatians uh, that you had to be circumcised. They were teaching that doctrine, you had to be circumcised, which was crucified to the cross. When it comes to persuasion, it can be powerful, especially when it's added with, with a zeal and conviction. But the conviction it has to be read. Without it being read, then it's just coming from that person's heart or that person's mind. When you look at the book of Job in the Old Testament, the book of Job, we know what Job went through. His kids perished as Satan put his hand on him. The oxen that were plying, the Bible says in Job 1, asses feeding beside them, Sabaeans fell upon them, took away uh, his property, the oxen. And it also says that the, uh, verse 15, Sabaeans fell upon them and took them away. Yea, they have slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and I only have escaped alone to tell thee. While he was yet speaking, there came also another, said, The fire of God has fallen upon from heaven, and hath burned up the sheep and the servants, and consumed them. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. Now, we know that Satan had his hands uh, concerning Job because God had allowed him. And it was actually Satan that brought down that fire and burnt up the sheep. Verse 17, while he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, The Chaldeans made out three bands and fell upon the camels, have carried them away, yea, and slain the servants with the edge of the sword. And I only am escape alone to tell thee. Now, Understand that they're still in they're still in all his property. Uh, they're still in his the, the fire burnt the sheep. Nobody stole those. But we got the camels being stolen. We got verse 14. The oxen were plowing and the asses feeding beside them. Sabians fell upon them, took them away. That's a lot of we're in Job chapter one. Okay, Job chapter one. Yes, ma'am. And if you look at the price of a horse. It's from five to fifteen thousand dollars sometimes per horse. That's like a car to, for today's prices. So they're stealing a whole bunch of these oxen, uh, the camels. Uh, all these things are being stolen from them. Not to mention when we're going to read that his children are going to be killed. Verse eighteen. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, "Thy sons and thy daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. Behold, there came a great wind." From the wilderness, smote the four corners of the house, and it fell upon the young men, and they are dead. And I, only I, am escaped alone to tell thee. Job arose, ran his mantle, shaved his head, fell down upon the ground and worshipped. And said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, the Lord had taken away, blessed be the name of the Lord. And all this Job sinned not nor charge God foolishly. Now, when it comes to what's happening in the invisible world, the conversation between Satan and God, Job doesn't know about that conversation. He didn't hear that. We're going to read about Job's friends. Job's friends didn't hear that conversation. They don't know about that. So when it comes to the result of what's happening, all his animals being taken from him, fire coming down and burning up the sheep. You got burnt sheep. That's the only thing, the animals that are left up, the camels, they took them. They took the oxen, they took the, uh, the Bible says the asses, they took them. The Sabians took them. So we got burnt sheep. We got a, a house full of dead children because the wind blew and now you got his dead kids inside our house. You got uh, his heart being afflicted. He rent his clothes. He said, naked I came I to my mother's womb. Naked shall I return. Satan again goes for another round. You know, you think in life when something comes at you, it's going to be over. But sometimes Satan makes a, a round two. You know, that's what happens in boxing. You know, round two. That's another round. Then verse number one, Job 2 1. Again, there was a day when 
The sons of God came to prepare themselves before the Lord. Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said to Satan, From whence comest thou? And Satan answered the Lord, and said, From going to and from the earth, from walking up and down in it. The Lord said to Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job? There is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and eschewed evil. And still he holdeth fast his integrity, although thou movest me against him, to destroy him without cause. Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin, yea, all that a man hath will he give for his life. But put forth thine hand now, and touch his bone and his flesh, he will curse thee to thy face. The Lord said to Satan, Behold, he is in thine hand, but save his life. So went Satan forth from the presence of the Lord, and smote Job with sore boils from the sole of his foot unto his crown. He took him a posture to scrape himself with all, and he sat down among the ashes. Now, what is Satan doing? What does he desire? He desires that Satan's, uh, forgive me, that Job's soul be worthless. Look what he's mentioning. He says, he will curse you to your face. When a person curses God to his face, his character is changed before God. Satan wants, and this is what he desires, that Job's soul and character and his integrity be removed from him. Satan is looking at a character on earth that has flesh and bones, that has more worth than Satan's character. This is what God is seeing. Look what I did to Job already. But he still is holding to his integrity. Look at the worth of his character. And Satan is looking at his character, who he used to be. And he doesn't like that. He doesn't like a human being made from flesh. That his character is worth more than him. Or that doesn't go against God. He wants Job's character to curse God. Because he sees human beings as nothing. They're disposable. Throw them in the, in the garbage of hell. And most of them will be thrown in hell's fire. Because they will agree with Satan. But what Satan is doing is. He's saying touch his skin. Put bulls on him. And then he'll curse you to your face. But verse 9. His wife. She gave in. Said unto him. Dost thou still retain thine integrity? Curse God and die. That's what she's saying. Curse God and die. And so some may have this mindset when they go through a multitude of trials. They said, forget God. I don't want to go back to church. I don't want to hear about them. Uh, you know, they, they say, don't pray for me. As our brother Winfrey mentioned. They say a multitude of things and their actions also speak. Their actions are also like words where their actions, they don't want to uh, draw near to God's word. Verse 10, but he said unto her, Thou speakest as one of the foolish women. Speak it. What? Shall we receive good at the hand of God, and shall we not receive evil? And all this did not Job sin with his lips. This is the type of person that Job is, that God wants us to look at, God wants us to be, because we don't know when Satan's going to come around the corner and start knocking. Sometimes he doesn't knock, he just busts through the door. And so, what did he lose? All his property. His children, uh, his his worth, his finances, the camels, the sheep, the oxen, they stole that. Sheep were burnt up. His body, now his health. His health from head to toe is now uh, is gone. He's scraping himself. He scraped himself. And he is still holding on to his integrity. And so when it comes to this action can we do this same action that joe went through Amen. that's powerful you know so what does he have the mindset of to love god above his family his property his things that he possesses to not be worried about maybe losing things that's the mindset that he also carries i'm not afraid of losing things you know for god still hold on to the integrity this persuasion coming out of him that calls you Satan is the accuser, accuser of our brethren, it says in Revelation. Uh, he's trying to persuade God this happens and then this will happen. But Job, Job was a man that, that sought after God and his will. Now in verse number 
if you go to verse number 11, Job chapter 2 verse 11, his friends come around. Now when Job's three friends heard of all this evil that was come upon him, they came everyone from his own place, Eliphaz the Temanite, and Bildad the Shuhite, and Zophar the Namathite. For they had made an appointment together to come to mourn with him and to comfort him. So two words, mourn and comfort. Remember that word comfort. 12, and when they lifted up their eyes afar off and knew him not, they lifted up their voice and wept. And they rent everyone his mantle and sprinkled dust upon their heads toward heaven. So they sat with him upon the ground seven days and seven nights. And none spake a word unto him, for they saw that his grief was very great, the Bible says. So they didn't speak for seven days. Seven whole days, they didn't say a word. They were just sitting down, looking at each other. And then verse 1, Job 3, 1. After this, opened Job his mouth and cursed his day. Job spake and said, Let the day perish wherein I was born. And the night in which it was said, there is a man child conceived. Let that day be darkness. Let not God regard it from above. Neither let the light shine upon it. Let darkness and the shadow of death stain it. Let a cloud dwell upon it. Let the blackness of the day terrify it, the Bible says. As for that night, let darkness seize upon it. Let, not, let it not be joined upon the days of the year. Let it not come unto the number of the months. Let that night be solitary. Let no joyful voice come thereon. And so this is something that can't happen. You can't turn back time and, and let this be. But he's, ex he's showing his, his emotion, his feelings concerning what is happening to him. Uh, his pain that he's going through. Uh, when you go to Job chapter 11. Now we read Job 2 where... Verse number 11 says, they came, his friends came to comfort him and mourn with him. That's what they came for. But when we read Job chapter number uh, 11, Job chapter 11, we're going to read of one of his friends. Job chapter 11, looking at verse 14. This is one of his friends, his name is uh, Zophar, Zophar. Job 11, 14. If iniquity be in thine hand, put it far away. And let not wickedness dwell in thy tabernacles. For then shalt thou lift up thy face without spot. Yea, thou shalt be steadfast and shalt not fear. Because thou shalt forget thy misery. And remember it was, it was, it, it has waters that passed away. And thine age shall be clearer than the noonday. Thou shalt shine forth, thou shalt be as the morning. And thou shalt be secure, because there is hope. Yea, thou shalt dig about thee, and thou shalt take thy rest in safety. So here, he's giving him words concerning what needs to be done to have uh, him be renewed in body, in, mo in soul, and mind. But in verse 14, it says, if there's a nigger in your hand, put it away from you. Let, don't let wickedness dwell in your tabernacle. Verse 3 of the same chapter Shall lies, should thy lies make men hold their peace? And when thou mockest, shall no man make thee ashamed. So, what do they want to do? They want to convince Job. You have sin on you, Job. This is why this is happening. Has that ever happened to you where someone wants soul to sin to be on your soul? They lead on their own understanding. That's why you should examine yourself. Because some do suffer for their sins. But in this case, the, his friends and Job, they didn't hear the conversation between Job, uh, Satan and, and God. They didn't hear that conversation. That was something done between them. But they've already come to a conclusion that, hey, Job, there's a nickel in your hands. Put it away from you. Don't let wickedness dwell in your tabernacles. Verse number 19, also, thou shalt lie down. And none shall make thee afraid. Yea, many shall make suit unto thee. But the eyes of the wicked shall fail. And they shall not escape. And their host shall be as the giving up of the ghost. You know, sometimes there's different cases. And I'll describe those cases. 
Sometimes it, a person locks up a person. A police locks up another person. Suppose criminal. They want to get a paycheck. Just say you did this crime. They won't give you the death penalty. You know, and they convince him to say this, say that. He says it, and then they give him 15 years, but he didn't do the crime. There's a lot of people accused in jail that shouldn't be in jail. There's some people that are in jail that should have not have been released from jail. You know, some of them that get murders, they got life in prison, but politicians, they want to stir up a certain area. Let's relieve these release these pedophiles and murderers who have supposed to be locked up for a certain time Amen. they release them because they want a certain power to be influenced remember who they release for instead of jesus christ give us Amen. who barabbas give us barabbas murder insurrection a thief and you know kill jesus christ the son of god let's kill him and let go of a, of a, of a murder and so when it comes to uh when it comes to today, in the church, uh, there's some people's sins that are still hold, held on to them because they haven't repented. They don't want to change from it, you know, and they're still supposed to be in jail, spiritual. There's some that they've been released from jail spiritually, but some people still want to keep them in jail. They're not supposed to be there. Some people that have maybe remarried. And God has washed away that sin Amen. concerning adultery. They've been remarried. Okay, they're one flesh. They love each other. They have kids. But the church wants them to be still guilty. I still want you to be guilty because you got remarried. You're going to be guilty until you let that woman divorce her because you remarried her. And you can go back to the first one. Then you'll be innocent. But right now you're guilty. You'll be guilty. There was a guy I talked to yesterday. He, uh, he's denomination. He says, if you have a tattoo, like, that you got from before you were Christian, and if you still have it today and you ha haven't gotten it re removed, you're still in sin, what he said. He says you're still in sin. And so, <clears throat> and then he went to the Old Testament where it talks about markings and, you know, tattoos from the Old Testament. And then I also mentioned unto him, okay, let's say I, I told him, what if I do take off all my tattoos? Okay, let's say I do that. Now, the Old Testament says markings, because I can make an image, I could burn an image in my skin. I told him, how do I get that removed? Because I burn that in my skin, an image, you know. So how, how can I get that removed if it's in the skin and it's burnt? There ain't, ain't nothing I can do about that. He said... Well, you got to talk to God about that one. <laughs> That's what he said. He said, you got to talk. No, 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 no. I said, no. The soul washes away the sin. From the, uh, Jesus' spirit washes away the sin from the soul. That's what I meant to say. So when it comes to the ink, that ink is, is powerless. It's, God washes with his spirit all the sins from the soul. So whatever's left on the skin, and that's, that's to say the skin returns back to the dust. And that's it. It doesn't resurrect out day of judgment when it resurrects the skin stays and the, the worms gobble it up like a pit bull eats his dog food or a piece of steak and so when it comes to his statement he couldn't answer the statement about the burnt skin how do i remove that you know he was stuck on that one you know so the idea is that when it comes to him trying to reason he wanted to keep me in jail he wanted the sense to be on me because there's ink i said what if i put this this pen, I write a little bit of a circle on your arm. Do you got sin? Same thing. What's the difference between a tattoo and a little a pink writing? The difference is the ink of the tattoo is inside. This ink is outside on your top of your skin. It's still on it. So are you in sin now because you got a little bit of ink on top of it? And so I was telling, I was trying to get him to understand that the, Jesus washes it in the water. But again, his doctrine is... It's got him so locked in that it's, that's a sin and it's not going to be removed until you get it surgically removed. But that's, that's his thinking. That's his way of seeing the scriptures. And he's seeing it in the wrong way because that's not how God operates. That's not how his mercy works. 
That's not how his love works. That's not how his cleansing works. The way he's been taught. So, you know, he's putting. He's like those police officers that put people in jail, and they're not supposed to be there. You know, that's how he he is like. Look at uh, look at Job chapter number eighteen again. Job chapter number eighteen. Looking at verse sixteen. <clears throat> The Bible says, Job 18, 16, this is another friend, this is Bildad, this is the second, another second guy, the second guy, Bildad, Job 18, verse 16, his roots shall be dried up beneath and above, shall his branch be cut off, his remembrance shall perish from the earth, he shall have no name in the street, he shall be driven from light to darkness and chased out of the world, he shall neither have son nor nephew, among his people, nor any remaining in his dwellings. They that come after him shall be astonished at his day, as they that went before were affrighted. Surely such are the dwellings in the wicked, and this is the place of him that knoweth not God. So he's letting them know concerning his status. You know, your branch is going to be cut off. Your roots are going to be dried up. He's saying, you don't know God, Job. They're trying to talk to him to, to get him to believe he made a sin. Now, the sin Job is going to do is that he's going to exalt himself and say, I can go up to God and show him my, my righteousness. That's where he sinned. But during that time frame, while they were talking, they were just trying to accuse him uh, of iniquity. Look at Job 19, verse 14. 19, 14. This is Job talking. It says, my kinfolk have failed. My familiar friends have forgotten me. They, they that dwell in my house and my maids count me for a stranger. I'm an alien in their sight. I called my servant and he gave me no answer. I entreated him with my mouth. My breath is estranged to my wife. Though I entreated for the children's sake of mine own body. Yea, young children despise me. I arose and they spake against me. Look at how much people are against him. His own servant. His wife, his friends that he's talking to. Everybody. Look at verse 19. All in my inward friends abhorred me, and they whom I loved are turned against me. My bone cleaveth to my skin and to my flesh, and I am escaped with the skin of my teeth. Have pity upon me, have pity upon me, O ye my friends, for the hand of God hath touched me. Why do you persecute me as God and are not satisfied with my flesh? Oh, that my words were now written. Oh, that they were printed in a book. That they were graven with an iron pen and lead in the rock forever. So he's trying to get them to entreat for him. Because he uh, is now recalling any sin he committed. They don't know of any sin he committed. And so they're just accusing him not knowing this. This power that happened in the, in the spiritual realm, this invisible realm, that has transferred over to the physical realm as well. Where now his flesh is being affected and all his children uh, have passed on. Look at, uh, look at the book of uh, Job, chapter number 42. Job chapter 42. Looking at verse number 7. Now, Job 42, 7. Is where God is speaking to Job now. He reproved Job for exalting himself. And then he's going to tell Job something in Job 42, 7. And it was so that after the Lord had spoken these words unto Job, the Lord said to Eliphaz the Temanite, My wrath is kindled against thee and against thy two friends. For ye have not spoken of me the thing that is right, as my servant Job had. Right. Therefore, take unto you now seven bullocks and seven rams, and go to my servant Job, and offer up for yourselves a burnt offering, and my servant Job shall pray for you. For him will I accept, lest I deal with you after your folly, in that ye have not spoken of me the thing which is right, like my servant Job. So Eliphaz the Temanite, and Bildad the Shuhite, and Zophar the Namathite, went and did according as the Lord commanded them. And the Lord also uh, accepted, uh, accepted Job. Now this is powerful because he's talking 
He's talking now to Eliphaz. He's talking. He was talking to Job. Then he switched over to Eliphaz. And started talking to him. And verse number uh, 10. And the Lord turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends also. The Lord gave Job twice as much as he had uh, before. Amen. So this is a blessing because they were trying to persuade Job that he sinned. And Job was trying to persuade him to comfort him. To show some love. Uh, but at the end, God, his, his word uh, cl cleared up everything concerning the sin that was committed by Job, the sin that was committed by his two friends, because sometimes we'll lean on, on own, we'll lean on our own understanding and just decide uh, what is truth and what is right concerning the, what is being suffered. So if someone's going through a scenario like Job, always explain to them, examine yourself. You know, if you sin or not, if you haven't sinned, we can't accuse you of sin, you know, because we, we, we don't know what you did secretly. We're not going to uh, say that you did anything secretly. Just examine yourself. We'll pray for you. Pray for strength that God help you. Um, but when you when you become like his three friends, then what happens is you begin in trouble with God because now you start adding to the truth of what really happened because they were, they were saying it was because of sin, but they can't see what happened in the spiritual realm. Look at uh, 2 Samuel chapter 16. 2 Samuel chapter, six, chapter 16. This is after, and we read this on Wednesday, after uh, David has slept with Bathsheba. Uriah the Hittite is dead. Now, there's a guy named Shimea. He curses David. Shimea, he curses him. In verse 5, when King David came, 2 Samuel 16, 5, to Behurim, behold, thence came out a man of family of the house of Saul, whose name was Shimea, the son of Gera. He came forth and cursed still as he came. And he cast stones at David, and at all the, all the servants of King David, and all the people, and all the mighty men who were on his right hand and on his left. And thus said Shimea, when he cursed, come out, come out, thou bloody man, thou man, and man of Belial. The Lord had returned upon thee all the blood of the house of Saul, in whose stead thou hast reigned. And the Lord had delivered the kingdom into the hand of Absalom thy son. And behold, thou art taken in the mischief, because thou art, thou art a bloody man. Then said Abishah the son of Zeruiah unto the king, Why should this dead dog curse my lord the king? Let me go over, I pray thee, and take off his head. The king said, What have I to do with you, you sons of Zeruiah, so let him curse, because the Lord has said unto him, Curse David, who shall then say, Wherefore hast thou done so? And David said to Abishai and to all his servants, Behold, my son, which come, came forth of my bowels, seeketh my life. How much more? How much more now may this Benjamite do? Let him alone. Let him curse, for the Lord hath bidden him. It may be that the Lord will look on my affliction. The Lord will require me good for his cursing this day. As, and as David and his men went by the way, Shimei went along on the hillside over against him and cursed as he went and threw stones at him, cast dust. And the king and all the people that were with him came weary and refreshed themselves there. So this guy is Shimei. He's cursing him. Now, in 2 Samuel chapter 12, it was already mentioned. Nathan told David, God already forgave you your sins already. He forgave you your sins. He told him though also that a neighbor uh, of your own household, he's actually in verse uh, 2 Samuel 12, 11. Thus said the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against thee out of thine own house. I will take away thy wives before thine eyes and give it to thy neighbor. He shall lie with thy wives in the sight of the sun. Now in verse... 13, David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said unto David, The Lord also hath put away thy sin, thou shalt not die. Now, Absalom, he did take the kingdom from him, which is what God told him was going to happen. But he also said, I'll take, I'm going to take away your sin. So Shimea, in his hatred and anger for David, is cursing him, calling him a child of Belial, throwing rocks at him. He is not recognizing that God already removed the sin. See, 
Absalom's still going to be persecuting and trying to get his father to take away his kingdom. But the sin has been removed. The sin's been removed. But Shimea doesn't want that sin to be removed. He wants the curse to continue Amen. all the way to the grave. And so when it comes to sin, when the iniquity is removed, it gets washed just like that. Whether in baptism or after baptism. And Shimei is the kind of guy where I want the sin to remain. I don't want it to go anywhere. Because I don't like this guy already. And I want to accuse him. And I want everybody to accuse him. I want everybody to hate him. Sometimes you may find people that, uh, that hate someone else. And then they want other people to hate that person as well. Whether it's through envy. Whether it's through malice. Whether it's uh, maybe they reprove them. It's different reasons. Different reasons. So this is the type of person that wants him locked up. Look at Matthew chapter 16 while we're talking about lock, locking up. Matthew 16. Look at that verse. Uh, I want to start at verse number 13. Matthew 16, 13. Jesus is talking to his disciples. And he says, when Jesus came to the coast of Sicily, Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say thou art John the Baptist, some Elijah, others Jeremiah, one of the prophets. He said unto them, But whom say ye that I am? Simon answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood had not revealed unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. So, when it comes to the keys to the kingdom of heaven, whatsoever is bound on earth is bound in heaven, loose on earth, loose in heaven. And all we can do is loose when a person is sincere and they repent of a sin, whether it's teaching that women can baptize, whether it's teaching there's nothing wrong with them shacking, they're going to get married in about six months, let them alone. If they repented of that, that was wrong what I taught concerning they should be shacking, brethren, I've been corrected. Then they, he's been loose to that teaching. Now the two that are shacking, if they're saints, they're still bound in that sin. Or if they're not saints, they're still bound in that sin. And they're separated from the kingdom. Mm -hmm. And so when a person uh, says, well, I'm a reverend. Uh, I mean, not a reverend, but a doctor. I got my doctorate. So that's why I'm called reverend in the Church of Christ. I mean, forgive me, called doctor in the Church of Christ. Now he's still... Uh, bound he's still bound because he just made a position and created something and added to the kingdom that God didn't authorize when it comes to instr instrumental music we just use instruments at 12 p.m. but at 9 a.m. we use just acapella singing worship so we have both his sins are still bound on him whether he in the 9 a.m. worship he doesn't use them. Or, and in the 12 p.m., he does use them. He's still bound because he's using them in the 12 p.m. So his 9 a.m., that sin is still bound unto him because he's 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 this he's agreeing that there's nothing wrong with it to have both. So he's pleasing men as Galatians chapter 1, Paul spoke against. Don't be pleasing men because you're not going to be pleasing Christ. So he's still locked up. Sure. Mike, what if he, what if he, what if he come and he's a, he, he's a part of our worship service and he's a Christian, and then at night he goes up to the Baptist church and he does that on a regular basis? Oh, he's bound. He's still bound. He's still bound. He's yeah. Mr. Them. Yeah. But he says he don't. You don't know who's saved, who's not saved over here. You know what's an example of that? That's a uh, Jehu. Jehu was bound. See, he was worshiping the Dan of Bethel, the golden calves. But then also he was uh, taking out the, the children of Baal, I believe. The children of Baal. Or was it Bilal? I, I believe it was Baal. But, yeah, he was doing a good work. He killed a lot of them, which was commanded for him to do.
But then he was over there going to Dan and Bethel. He was going to Golden Calves. And so, yeah, that's the same type of scenario. Church of Christ and then Baptist with his wife. If his wife was a Baptist, I'm going to go with her. Oh, yeah. To please her. Happy wife, happy life, like they say. Yeah. Happy wife, happy life sometimes makes an angry God. Angry God makes a fiery hell for that soul that wanted to make a happy wife, a happy life. So look at, uh, thank you, brother. Uh, look at Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18, looking at verse 9. Luke chapter 18. Looking at verse 9. And he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up into the temple to pray. The one a Pharisee and the other a publican. Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I have fast twice in a week. I give tithes of all I possess. And the publican standing afar off will not lift up so much as his eyes into heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalted himself shall be abased. He that humbled himself shall be exalted. Amen. So again, this, this Pharisee, he's saying what he's not doing. Uh, extortioners, unjust adulterers, and then he, but he, he's talking about this publican as if all the publicans are the same. See, some publicans were as Zacchaeus. Some publicans were honest from the beginning. And he's confessing his sin. He says, be merciful to me a sinner. It gets washed. But for himself, for the Pharisee, he actually went home with his sins. That's right. He didn't get go home washed. He went home with them. And that may happen in a church. And the church bolted together in one place. And one go home, goes home sanctified. And then one goes goes home back to their house to watch uh, Netflix with their sin. They're sitting there watching Netflix and their sin is with them. It's them, their sin, and Netflix hanging out. And then the publican gets uh, justified because he was sincere and, and he repents. Look at, uh, let me see, John chapter number 21. John chapter number 21. This is where Jesus had a conversation with Peter. He keeps he tells him uh, three times, "Feed my sheep." Do you love me, Peter? Feed my sheep. Thou lovest me. Feed my sheep. Verse eighteen. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, when thou was young, thou girdest thyself and walkest whither thou wouldest. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thine hand, and another shall gird thee and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. This speak he signified by what death he should glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said unto him, follow me. That's what he said. He says, follow me. Then Peter turned about to see the disciple whom Jesus loved, following which also leaned on his breast at supper, and said, Lord, which is he that betrayed thee? Peter, seeing him, said to, to Jesus, Lord, and what shall this man do? Jesus said to him, if I will. That he tarry till I come. What is that to thee? Follow thou me. So Peter is like, man, Peter is. Remember, he's been reproved. He's been exposed. He lied. He said he was going to die with Jesus. He didn't. He cried and wept bitterly. Remember, before this, Jesus, before Jesus' crucifixion, the disciples were talking about who was the greatest. Before the, his crucifixion, they, uh, John and James were talking about I let my son sit on the right hand, another son sit on the left hand, and then the other disciples were, were angry after they said that. So there's like some, some built up, there's still some little built up color uh, brewing in Peter, you know. And so Peter's like, well, what's this guy going to do? What's he going to do? And, and Jesus is trying to get him to focus. If I will that he tear till I come. What is that to you? What is that? What, is, what business is that of yours, Peter? Amen. He's like, follow me. Focus on me. But Peter is like, he's, he's, he's everywhere. Sometimes 
In verse 23, then went this saying abroad among the brethren that the disciple should not die. Yet Jesus said not unto him, he shall not die. But if I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? This is that disciple which testified these things and wrote these things. And we know that his testimony is true. So verse 25, and there also, and there are also many other things which Jesus did. The which, if they should be written, everyone, I suppose that even the world itself cannot contain the books that should be written. Amen. Amen. And so here, we have where Peter is now spreading this, because it was told to him, he's spreading this thing, he's not going to die. He's not gonna, he told me I'm going to die, I'm, I'm have my, uh, when I get old, my hands are going to be stretched out. But this guy, John, he's, he isn't going to die. And so they're spreading these news about, but that's not what Jesus said. He said, uh... If I will that he tarry till I come. That's what he said. And so when it comes to uh, persuasion, part two, this persuasion coming out of him that calleth you. Take heed, brethren, that you not be persuaded uh, in the wrong direction. As Satan is the accuser of the brethren, he wants to persuade us. Look at uh, Acts chapter 24. There's another guy that tries some persuasion. Acts chapter 24, his name is uh, Tertullus. And it wasn't just Tertullus, it was also uh, the other uh, the other elders, Ananias, that were also trying to persuade. Acts 24, verse 1. And after five days, Ananias the high priest descended with the elders and with a certain orator named Tertullus, who informed the governor against Paul. And when he was called for, Tertullus began to accuse him, saying, Seeing that by thee we enjoy great quietness, and that very worthy deeds are done unto this nation by thy providence. We accept it always, and in all places, most noble Felix, with all thankfulness. So he's telling him concerning his governing power. You know, we're thankful. We're thankful for your work in, in the government. Uh, we appreciate it. Thank you for cleaning up the criminals. Uh... You know, a very political uh, way to present. Uh, verse 4, Notwithstanding that I be not further tedious unto thee, I pray thee that thou wouldest hear us of the clemency a few words. For we have found this man, a pestilent fellow, and a mover of sedition among all the Jews throughout the world, and a leader of the sect of the Nazarenes, who also has gone about to profane the temple, whom we took and would have judged according to our law. He's a very good orator. This is what he does. Amen. So verse number 7. But the chief captain Lysias came upon us with great violence. Took him away out of our hands. Now it wasn't through great violence. He's lying. Commanded his accusers to come unto thee. By examining of whom that self mayest take knowledge of all these things. Whereof we accuse him. And the Jews also assented saying that these things were so then paul after that the governor had beckoned unto him to speak answered for as much as i know that thou has been of many years a judge unto this nation i do more cheerfully answer for myself because that thou mayest understand that there are yet but 12 days since i went up to jerusalem for the worship and they neither found me in the temple disputing with any man neither raising up the people neither in the synagogues nor in the city, neither can they prove the things whereof they now accuse me. And so what is Paul bringing? He's bringing the gospel. Jesus Christ, he's the son of God. He sits at the right hand. He has a church. This sect that Tertullus talked about of the Nazarenes, that's the church that Jesus built. He said he was going to build. Right. Jeremiah 31 talked about concerning the new covenant. Uh, the New Kingdom, Acts, Daniel chapter 2 talked about. You know, there's a lot of people that persuaded Ananias and, and uh, Ananias and, give me one second, next chapter number 5. Ananias and Sapphira, forgive me. Ananias and Sapphira, one of them persuaded the other and then they lied to the Holy Spirit. They both dropped dead. Amen. When you look at 1 Kings, uh, 1 Kings chapter number 13, this is after this is after uh, 
Jeroboam, he built a gold, two golden calves, one in Dan, one in Bethel. Now, what he's trying to do in verse 1 Kings 13, 1, Behold, there came a man of God out of Judah by the word of the Lord unto Bethel. Jeroboam stood by the altar to burn incense. He cried against the altar in the word of the Lord and said, O altar, altar, thus saith the Lord, Behold, a child shall be born unto the house of David, Josiah by name, and upon thee shall he offer the priests of the high places that burn incense upon thee. And men's bones shall be burned upon thee. And he gave a sign the same day, saying, This is the sign which the Lord has spoken. Behold, the altar shall be rent, and the ashes that are upon it shall be poured out. It came to pass, when the king Jeroboam heard the saying of the man of God, which had cried against the altar in Bethel, that he put forth his hand from the altar, saying, Lay hold on him, and his hand which he put forth against him dried up, so that he could not pull it again to him. The altar also was rent, and the ashes poured out from the altar, according to the sign which the man of God had given by the word of the Lord. Now here, Jeroboam, he's going to burn incense uh, at this fake altar, because he made one in Dan and in Bethel, right? Now you got Uzziah, where Uzziah in 2 Chronicles 26, he was one that was at the real temple to light incense. And he turned into a leper. Jeroboam, he's going to go burn incense, burn incense at a false altar in Bethel. And in verse number uh, 6, uh, he's, he's praying, he's, he's asking, The king answered and said unto the man of God, and treat now the face of the Lord thy God, and pray me that my hand be restored again. And the man of God besought the Lord, and the king's hand was restored him again, and became as it was before. So, here we have where God restored his hand, but he didn't restore and remove the golden calves from Dan and Bethel. He left them. So, after you've seen God's power, your hand is it, turned, is dried up, and then he asked God to to uh, restore it. It gets restored. But why was it restored? He showed mercy. Shouldn't you have removed the golden calf from down in Bethel? He didn't remove it. He kept it afterward. Uzziah, he tried to light the incense. He turned into a leper all the days of his life. Now, the persuasion of that hand drying up should have persuaded him. This is God's power. I shouldn't be building Dan, uh, two golden calves, calves in down in Bethel. That's going to cause a lot of people to die lost. He should have seen that power of his hand. I believe. Let me, let me repent of my sins. But he didn't. The same prophet was told. Verse 8. Because he tried to invite him to his house. And the man of God said unto the king. If thy will. No he tried to give him a reward. Forgive me. Verse 8. And the man of God said unto the king. If thou will give me half thine house. I will not go in thee. Neither will I eat bread nor drink water in this place. For it was charged me. By the word of the Lord, saying, Eat no bread, nor drink water, nor turn again by the same way that thou camest. So he went another way, and returned not by the way that he came to Bethel. The same prophet was told by another prophet in the same chapter uh, to, that an angel spoke to him. Go to my house, eat with me. Because he heard that he spoke to the king. He said, I can't do it. I can't go to your house. I can't eat bread. I can't drink water. Into any direction. That's what the God said. But the prophet spoke falsely to me. Lied to him. He said come to me. An angel talked to me. He ate with him. And guess what happened to him next. He got ate by a lion. Amen. Ate by a lion. The same person. That God said don't go into anybody's house. Don't eat bread. So as we begin to close. Those listening understand that. There's a lot of men speaking under the sun. They're persuading you. Into denominational things. Whether it's Baptists. Catholic, Methodist, they got this Muslims saying that Jesus Christ is not the Son of God. He was just a good prophet. He was a good prophet, a real good prophet, but he wasn't the Son of God. They'll say that. I talked to a guy, I believe it was uh, yesterday. He said he was a good, he was a good prophet, not the Son of God. He was a guy from uh, India. He was at the gas station, uh, and he told me that. But I told him the Bible says he's the Son of God. You know, there's a lot of people that are persuading you to get drunken with them. They don't like to be drunk by themselves or they don't like to be high by themselves. They want you to get high with them. 
There's a lot of men persuading women to lay with them. A lot of men persuading uh, women persuading men, men persuading women to lay with them, uh, sleep with them, fornicate, and they're both in that same sin. If you die in your sins, where am you cannot come? That sin doesn't get washed away. There's people that are in their 60s and 70s that I talked to, in their 80s, that still talk about fornication. You know, they still talk about fornication, even at that age. And it doesn't matter what age they are. Their soul is still going to be put into a devil's hell. Why? Because that's a place prepared for the devil and his angels. Amen. Those devil and the angels went against God's word. Human beings, which are not angels, that go against God's word, go to the same place. Why? Because sin is not going to be accepted into the heavens. And the soul has to be washed and be added to this kingdom. Amen. Christ is one day going to return in flaming fire with his angels. From above, the Bible says, every eye shall see him. Even those that pierced him will see, will see him. And those in paradise will resurrect out, be taken up. But those on earth will be taken second. But you have to be in that church to be taken. In that body. The same church, one body, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Romans 16, 16 says, the churches of Christ salute you. That same church is here today, same Holy Spirit. But many don't like it. Many don't like that. They call it a sect. They call it a cult. They call it different things. They say, you, you, you think you're the only ones going to heaven? Well, we know that the faithful in the body of Christ are because the Bible says it does one body, one spirit. We don't apologize for that. You can be saved. We'll have a Bible study with you. Or you can be added to that same church. Have your sins removed. Receive that same Holy Spirit. And Christ will add you to his number. And you begin your walk. To follow him. At this time we'll be closing with a prayer. If our brothers can close us.